While I've covered at least it seems like a lot of bands who came out of the later part of the glam metal era, today we're going to talk about a band who came up during the beginning of the early 80s that's really saw an influx of hard rock and so-called metal groups and one of them was the group Autograph. Today let's take a look at whatever happened to the band. The early history of Autograph really begins with the early 80s group called Silver Condor. They had a hit song on their first album name, You Could Only Take My Heart Away, which was a top 40 hit. The band only put out two records, with the lineups changing considerably between each release. The only constant was the group's frontman, Joe Carasano, and part of the second incarnation of the band had rhythm guitarist and future Autograph frontman Steve Plunkett. The band quickly dissolved after their second record, with Carasano going on to have a pretty successful career writing jingles for Miller Lite, Coca-Cola, the US Army, and he even sang the song Hands Across America. Plunkett, now a free agent, opted to start his own band with a bunch of other session musicians from LA, and really the timing couldn't have been more perfect. The early 80s saw the emergence of groups like Molly Crew and Quiet Riot. In fact, in 1983, Quiet Riot made history becoming the first so-called metal group to have a number one record in the US with Metal Health. Couple this with the rise of popularity of MTV, and you quickly had record labels trying to sign these types of bands. Plunkett's new outfit autograph and their members were a little jaded already with the music industry by the time the group formed. The five piece would be made up of vocalist and rhythm guitarist Steve Plunkett, guitarist Steve Lynch, keyboardist Steve Isham, bassist Randy Rand, and drummer Kenny Richards. Lynch played with Savoy Brown and Greg Lake of Emerson, Lake & Palmer. While Lynch was a pretty accomplished guitar player, already teaching the instrument, and he had his own guitar tapping technique, which some compared to Eddie Van Halen, and he also released a guitar book called The Right Touch. The band would cite early ACDC and Van Halen as being some of their influences. In the case of the music business, it helps to have friends in high places, and Autograph was really no different. There's been a couple different variations of what happened in the beginning, but drummer Kenny Richards actually struck up a friendship with Van Halen frontman David Lee Roth. There was one story that they met at a sushi bar, while another claimed they met at a party, but soon enough they became jogging buddies, and it was one day Richards gave the Van Halen frontman Autograph's demo tape. Roth liked the tape so much, he actually asked the band to open for Van Halen in 1984. One thing to point out is that Autograph was such a new band, they'd only been together for a couple months, they didn't have a name, they'd never played a gig together, and they didn't have a record label deal either. So opening for Van Halen was actually their first gig they played. Autograph's first ever performance took place in front of 20,000 fans in Jacksonville, Florida. It was only when the band drove from LA to Jacksonville that they came up with the name Autograph. It's been insinuated that perhaps their name was inspired by the Def Leppard song Photograph. The band would raise $9,000 to cover expenses for the tour, and even Van Halen told them not to take it personally if the band didn't last more than a few shows. The band weren't asked even to perform live in front of Van Halen, as the decision to have them open for David Lee Roth and company was made based off the strength of their demo tape. They opened 47 dates for Van Halen with some hiccups. There was one show in Lakeland, Florida that the band were pelted with beer bottles, but the attention that they garnered opening for Van Halen got a lot of interest from record labels, and it would be following a show in Madison Square Garden in New York City that RCA Records attended the show and signed the band. Steve Lynch would later appear on the Waste Some Time with Jason Green podcast and talked about touring with Van Halen. He would admit that Van Halen wanted an opening act that was basically what he referred to as a t-shirt band. What's a t-shirt band you're maybe asking? Well, it's a band that audience members don't really care about and they leave the auditorium to go buy merch from the headliner. Lynch would also reveal how he was told by Van Halen's management not to do his guitar tapping technique because that was Eddie's thing. When Lynch confronted Eddie about it, he claimed the guitarist wasn't in the loop as to what management was telling him, and he told Lynch to play whatever he wanted on stage. It was following their tour with Van Halen, they would record their first album, Sign In Please, and it would produce the band's biggest hit, and really the only song they're known for, Turn Up the Radio, which was recorded later on in the recording process. The band apparently were even lukewarm to the song, but they kept it on the album. It was at the request of the band's manager that they sought outside help to help finance the video for the song. Given the band's name, the group's manager thought it would actually be a good idea to go to some pen and paper companies and see if they would finance the music video in exchange for some product placement. Autograph would end up securing some funding from Papermate, and they ended up doing a product placement for the song. Because of the collaboration, the band were able to make a much more expensive video than they originally thought. As for how they felt about doing promotional tie-ins, Plunkett would tell the Los Angeles Times, no, we needed the money. With a name like Autograph, it's only logical for us to be a pen. It would seem out of place if we were advertising something like a vacuum cleaner or a roach spray. 
Released in September of 1984, the album took several months to make its mark. In the first three months, it sold about 80,000 copies, but it would be in January of 85 that Turn Up the Radio took off. By the way, I gotta bring this up guys, anyone remember playing Grand Theft Auto Vice City and radio station V-Rock? This song would peak at number 29 on the Hot 100 chart by early 85. The success of the band's first album shocked the members themselves and they even said in one interview that it even shocked the record label. The band also appeared on a number of movie soundtracks including Secret Admirer, Fright Night, Youngblood and Winning is Everything. But critics weren't very kind to the band in general, blasting their lyrics, and the band was even accused frequently of ripping off Def Leppard. But they did have some fans with their hometown paper, the Los Angeles Times, writing about the group in 1985, with its wealth of talent, Autograph could become one of the major metal bands in the next few years. That, of course, wouldn't be the case. The band came back in 1985 with their second record, That's the Stuff, but they couldn't find a producer, so they co-produced the album. The lead single, Blondes and Black Cars, would be inspired by Plunkett and Richards, new cars that they bought with their rock star money. The pair were joking one day about the only thing better than a black car was a black car with blondes in it. Despite getting some high-profile touring spots with Motley Crue and Hart, the album really wasn't much of a commercial success. The album only peaked at number 92 on the album charts and they just didn't have another hit like Turn Up The Radio. The group's third record was pretty much the same story and it fared actually even worse despite spending more money and taking more time on the album. Soon enough, the band's relationship with RCA was over and they were dropped. Autograph underwent some lineup changes and they tried to record a fourth album and even got a record deal from Epic Records in 1989, but they opted not to pursue that avenue. The fourth record would, however, see a release sometime in the late 90s. Plunkett would go on to get involved in music publishing and working with other artists who were the top hit makers of their day, and even got involved in music and television soundtracks as well, composing with MTV and the Big Four Networks and even HBO. Plunkett brought the band back from 2002 to 2005, even released their fifth album, Buzz, and there's been various lineups of the band since 2013, but three of the original members, including Isham, Richards, and Rand, passed away between 2008 and 2022. In 2022, Rand would die at the age of 69, and he was the only remaining member of the lineup at the time. It was following his passing, the existing members tried to use the band's name, but Steve Lynch was able to get a court order barring them from doing so. That does it for today's video, guys. Thanks for watching. And as always, if you have suggestions for future topics, let me know in the comments section below. And we'll see you again in Rock and Roll Your Stories sticker.